Ken, welcome to the Way of Champions podcast. You and I have been um, in contact for many years. You're, you're always a source of great information and uh, interesting articles and things to read or listen to. And so we finally found the time to get you on here and share some of your learned experience and wisdom of 40 years or so in the trenches of uh, college and professional football. Well, it's glad to be on. I appreciate you asking me, and and uh, uh, it should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, your your career, you know, as I was getting ready for the podcast here and just looking at all the different levels that you've coached at from high school in Texas to prep school in Massachusetts to college assistant, Division three college head coach, 1AA at my alma mater, Fordham, um, to... University of Iowa, Miami Dolphins. Um, you've seen it all, haven't you? Well, I don't know if I'd say that because you know very well as soon as you say it that you'll see something different tomorrow. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Maybe 15 minutes from now, you know, because <laughs> I've I've been helping uh I've been helping out some guys down here that have been training for the combine and and for their pro days as well. So yeah, I uh, I hesitate that I've said uh, to say that I've seen it all. There, there are guys that have you know put in more more time than me, even, and I'm sure they've seen a few other things. But um, it's uh, it was a, it was a great ride. I enjoyed every second of it at every level. I think that um, all the different experiences gave me a much different perspective on how to look at things when you're in the classroom teaching uh, K through six or junior high, you know, uh, it's, uh, or even in, up at, uh, you know, up at Worcester Academy where, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, I was, you know, I taught U.S. history to foreign students, mm -hmm. um, taught phys ed, ran the dining hall, uh, was a dorm master, had, had football coach, had baseball coach, and you're only 24 years old. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, you wonder what the heck is going on half the time, but you're just trying to, you know, you're just trying to keep up, uh, keep up with those kids all the time. And, and, uh, but it's been a lot of fun, but I, you know, it's helped me immensely in, uh, my ability to, uh, you know, deal with people, I think, and, and certainly, um, uh, you know, coach and, mm -hmm. and teach in the in the classroom just helps you take it to a different level i think that a, a lot of people miss out on if they jump right into uh you know right into the coaching and never have to spend any actual time in the classroom i think that's a fascinating point because but it's you know it's it's been interesting as well where i think in the beginning one of the things i think everybody gets confused on and you'll like this because you're a Fordham grad and I'm a John Carroll grad and they're both Jesuit institutions. But mm -hmm. before I could even actually figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, I needed to figure out maybe what my purpose might be, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the Jesuits are great at banging that in your head. You know, what's your purpose? And next is what's your philosophy? And then it's, you know, hey, where do you go from there? You got to have a plan and a process and all that. But anyway, um, you know, so the toughest part a lot of times is getting that purpose figured out. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that you want to make sure that you don't do when you enter the field of coaching is that you're not trying to extend your playing career. Mm -hmm by coaching. And you've talked about that previously and as I, well. And I think that's uh, really fascinating because m most people's playing career end not on their terms, right? If Even if you're lucky enough to make it to the highest level, most people get cut. They don't get a new contract, whatever. College, it ends. You would love to keep playing, but your college career is over. Um, high school, injury, all these different things. And yeah, we've talked about it many times that then we carry this baggage sometimes of unfulfilled dreams of being an athlete 
and then and, and then the love of the I always think it's like the love of the locker room, right? That camaraderie of the bus, the locker room, and you want that again. So you go into coaching thinking you're just going to be one of the guys <laughs> or one of right. the girls, and you bring all this baggage and your competitive drive or whatever, and that it does not set you up to be a very good mentor. And then your other point, if you've never been in a classroom or anything and you've never tried teaching, you might have a lot of knowledge of the sport, but you have no idea how to get it across. And so yeah. lack of teaching experience and lack of acceptance of where you are in life, put those two things together and you get a lot of angry young coaches. And I would probably say I was one of them. Well, it, it it's hard, you know, because as you well know, uh, you have you have kids and you've coached and you've had young coaches, uh, you know, uh, work with you as well. But sometimes advice is of limited value and mm -hmm. experience ends up being the thing that uh, teaches you the most. A lot of times it spanks you uh, before it teaches you. But, it, um, it, you know, it's it's something that I felt like. Okay, why? Why do I want to? You know what? You know what's the best way for me uh, to fulfill this plan that uh, that maybe God has or the world has for me or whatever? Um, you know, and what's going to be my vehicle? Mm -hmm. And so, like my mom might have told you that she knew I was going to coach when I was six years old, <laughs> and I took all the flour out of the pantry and I went up to the baseball field, you know, quarter mile from my house with my buddies and lined the field with flour. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and then I, then we, then we all went home and got our dads and our bats and our gloves and balls and went back to the field and our fathers kind of coached us up you know, while we were there because there was no organized baseball for, for my age group back then. Yeah. And so we needed to do it, you know, needed to do it ourselves and don't <laughs> even ask me where I got the idea. But, you know, my mom, you know, she, we had six kids. I was the oldest and, and uh, you know, all she could do was laugh, you know, even though she had no flour left, I forget what she was going to cook that or bake that day or whatever, but nothing left in, you know, nothing left in the cupboard. But, you know, since that, you know, you graduate from college, what am I going to do? What's my purpose in life? And, you know, you know, now, you know, I think, well, you know, I would love to be able to give back to somebody all the lessons that I've learned over these years uh, from playing football or baseball or all these great coaches that I, and mentors that I've had. All I want is to give back to the guys I have the opportunity to coach, you know, let them have the same experience that, that I've had, you know, how to be part of a great team, you know, how, how, you know, how to be, uh, how to learn how to work hard, you know, how to develop certain fundamental skills that the game may, you know, offer you. But bottom line is no matter where I coached, whether as an assistant or a head coach or whatever, didn't matter. I wanted the players to have the most, you know, positive and influential experience that they were going to have, you know, in college, in high school, in the pros, whatever it may be. Uh, and the vehicle we were going to use was the football field. You know, mm -hmm. there was just another classroom that was a hundred yards long with you know, with stripes every five, every five yards, but, you know, and every professor, let's say at Allegheny college had the same goal, whether they mm -hmm. taught English or biology, they wanted their, their students to have the most positive influential experience as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that became the purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove me to where, where we're going to do, you know, what, what, what I was going to do. And then, build a philosophy, uh, you know, around that. And that was really, Hey, you know, it, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about how to improve, how to get better, how to give your absolute best, 
how to work hard. We're not going to focus on wins Mm -hmm. or results necessarily. We'll let those take care of themselves if we put the proper processes uh, and and, uh, teaching protocols in place. And that's really, you know, how we've, you know, always operated. And that's also the reason why I was told when I was in division three, that I was too idealistic to ever coach in division one or in the NFL. Mm. And, uh, you know, so, but that's always how it's been. It just, um, I think one of the biggest issues we have, the biggest, the biggest changes we have um, right now has been the culture of winning, you know, like what's changed. If you ask me you know, when I, you know, when I was even in high school till now, or, uh, you know, other than using the flower, to, uh, you know, the wine fields, I, um, you know, I think, you know, yeah, it, the price of gas was 26 cents a gallon when I first started driving, you know, you mm-hmm. can still, you could still uh, put, you know, put it, you could put a dime in a phone booth and call your girlfriend. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that, but we're, things that haven't changed, we still have war. We still have, you know, uh, environmental problems. We have political issues. We, you know, we all have, we have the same issues. Some of them are more advanced. Some of them are less advanced, but mm-hmm. you know, we, you know, we've got to work our, work our way through, through, through all of them. But I think the, 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 the question always gets asked, how much have the kids changed or has it been the parents and the coaches? And, you know, the kids have changed a little only because of the influence that they've been under, I think, you know, but they, you know, they still want to be coached. Well, that's uh, what I was going to ask you. Let me just jump in and say, we, we focus on this and we say, hey, the kids have changed, right? Okay, great. The kids have changed. Um, well, I mean, A, if we don't like how they've changed, who raised them? number one, right? And that's sure. this uh, this generation of parents. But I think what's most important is what about the kids has not changed? What do they want from a coach? What do they want from this experience? Because those things are probably the same thing that you wanted when you were growing up and I wanted when I was growing up. And it's the same thing that my kids want today and that their kids are going to want. Um, so what do you think more than what has changed what hasn't changed well the uh i think that the the basis of why you play or participate hasn't necessarily changed but the 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 part that is uh has gotten out of out of hand is what are we after you know what you know, the, the winning culture has changed everything. Instead of, um, in, instead of trying to figure out uh, that, hey, you know, at this stage, and part of the reason I'm here talking to you today is because there were three stages in my life as an athlete that were, you know, really affected by people that did an outstanding job with me and the, and, and, and the other guys that were around me, but like, let's say our youth, our youth football coaches, they made things fun. Mm-hmm. Okay. They made it fun. They made it. So we liked to, to play that, you know, yeah, it was tough. You know, they made, they made it so much fun that you weren't, you weren't scared. You weren't scared to do some of these things that, you know, that, guys hold back on in certain types of environments because they're too focused on winning instead of, you know, being, uh, you know, like experimenting a little bit, you know, uh, you know, exploring, letting it, letting it go, letting it fly a little, um, you know, at times. But, you know, I just think, you know, it's the, the whole um, uh, culture of youth sports in a lot of ways is dominated by adults and mm. the kids don't have the opportunities to, you know, to explore, to experiment, to go up to the field with your buddies and, you know, and just play. 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, go go up to the basketball court. Heck, I can remember, you know, we, you know, if it, if we had a big snowstorm, we in school was called off. You know, we'd uh, I grew up in a place called Milford, Connecticut. It was great. There'll be no, you know, you hear the radio, no school in Milford today. So mm-hmm. myself and my brothers grab a couple of snow shovels. We run up to the hill, shovel off the shovel off the the basketball court, half half court, and go back at noon. We knew it'd be dried out. We could play basketball all day long. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you're you're just out there, you know, doing stuff all the time on a pond. You're playing hockey or mm-hmm. whatever. It's even to this day, when uh, when I see a kid riding down the street with a with a bat uh, across his handlebars and a glove on there, you know, I say to myself, "Hey, he might have a chance to be something mm-hmm. because he's out there, you know, working and 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 finding out a lot about himself." But mm-hmm. you know, we success. You know, I think the, the tough part today is we've got success all wrong. You know, the definition of success is, is like, you know, okay. It's become, you know, starting position. It, mm. It's become a scholarship. It's yeah, become getting recruited, a, getting seen, getting, all, getting my yeah, statistics. All, all that stuff that, you know, rather right now, and, and, you know, it's it's not unusual for parents to want those things. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it isn't because it's just like they want their, their their children to get the best education they could possibly get. Mm-hmm. Gotta, the um, but the the bot the bottom line is the the kids aren't after that at all, in my mm-hmm. opinion. You know, the parents. are. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's and that goes down to this idea of ownership, whose goals Is it who owns the experience, right? And I think because when I was growing up or you were growing up, it was sort of like, you know, you played sports and you played them seasonally and you played with your buddies and you pick up games and all this. And, you know, in in high school, then you started saying, you know what, I want to pursue football or baseball or something maybe at a higher level. But you were mature enough and old enough to figure that out. Now we have this system where in some places at six years old, they're running tryouts for baseball. Right. Right. And, and, you know, eight years old tryouts for football and soccer. And so parents have to have to, because the eight year old, the seven year old, the six year old, isn't mature enough to make those decisions. The parents have to make them for them. Right. And so they, they take over ownership. They get sucked into this. um, Well, if we, made this team. Now we have to get the private coach already. We have to commit year round already. And it's just this, it's this endless cycle of decisions taken out of the hand of the child. And then I get these emails of someone who says, you know, my, my kid used to love insert sport, tennis, soccer, and he wanted to practice all the time and everything. And now all of a sudden he doesn't want to go. What should I do? And my first question is, well, how old is he? And they say nine. And I'm like, let him take some time off. Like that wasn't even a question 30 years ago. But we would say, well, of course, a nine-year-old who's done this for three years straight doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> take a break, you know, but that's that's the problem. And so it's sort of like the survival of the fittest. And I mean, I'm I'm sure you would even see it at the collegiate level you know, people who made it through and got there, but there was no joy. There was no love of the sport left They're They're just burnt. Like the whole thing was get the scholarship, get the spot, but then there's no more development anymore. Is there? No, no, that, that's the biggest, um, you know, the biggest issue, the emphasis is on all these other things. And then at some point it's going to become on winning as well which really deteriorates, uh, you know, into a bunch of, you know, negative things eventually because the emphasis should be on doing your best and having fun Mm -hmm. is really where it should be. And then parents, you know, they need to, and you've had Jessica Leahy on your podcast. I know. Yeah. 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 One of my favorite books is the gift of failure. It's one of my favorite terms. You know, nobody wants their children to fail, but that's their best 
that's their best chance to learn about themselves and about er the environment around them. Just, you know, let them fail with support basically is all you need to do. But they've lost, you know, a lot of the kids have lost their independence, as I said, and, and um, they somehow have to be able to wrestle it back. But that's only going to happen with the, with, you know, adult intervention and, and uh, assistance because um, unless, you know, and that's what's so great about what you have done. Like how many years have you been at this now, John? Uh, 10, about 10, a little yeah, more. 10, mm -hmm. Yeah. 10, 10 years. So, you know, you were, you were getting started about the time I hit Miami, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, you, um, what you're doing is, is, is unbelievable when, you know, what you're doing for youth sports, because, you know, youth sports, it used to be just a cottage industry. Now it's a major industry in our society that it's bigger than the NFL. Yeah. It, dr it drives, mm -hmm. you know, it's a driver, you know, mm -hmm. in, in of, of economies now, I think, you know, and, mm -hmm. and those are, you know, the, those are tough things, but you know, we gotta, we gotta get it back to the, to the players, to the kids, you know, I think, which you're doing a lot, you know, you're doing a lot right now to help with your, your books and your statistical information is just eye opening. I hope more people would take advantage of that, you know, and, and then, you know, we, we're talking about things that, you know, things that are a little different at this point too. One of the real problems in all of sports, especially in youth sports though, is the lack of respect that everybody has for the opponents, coaches, spectators and the players themselves mm -hmm. and to me you know I, I define you know respect as a genuine appreciation for the person the opinion that person may have the judgment that may they make or you know the uh, the work that they do it can be any of those things but just a genuine appreciation you know for Hey, th those opponents, they practice just as hard as you. They mm -hmm. want to win just as much as you. You know, they, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we respect each other? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's kind of crazy. No, it, it, it is crazy. And then, I, I mean, what I'm concerned about is now we take things like uh, image and likeness rights on the collegiate level, which I, I mean, my personal opinion is that uh, a lot of athletes where universities are making a lot of money off their likeness or their image should be able to get a, a piece of that. The idea that someone couldn't get $20 for signing an autograph always seems silly to me. Um, but now that's establishing itself very messily in the collegiate level, but also in many states, it's now trickling down, right? We see high school students mm -hmm. signing these things. So right. the more that that age trickles down where someone can get paid for what they do is more encouragement to have that Instagram account, the TikTok account, showing my highlights, showing me, you Oops. know, make, I making, you? no, I got gotcha. you. I, I got gotcha. you. The, the video froze, but we're good. But, um, you know, we can see all these things. Can you hear me? Yes. Ken, are you there? Yeah, you're there. You're back. Oh, okay, great. Uh, well, let, let, let me say this since we, we just had a little uh, hiccup there. Um, with these image and likeness now trickling down to high school and, um, you know, the now younger and younger kids, 16, 14, 12, can get money for what they do, for having lots of Instagram followers, for having their highlight reel up there. It's just pushing this age of specialization and everything younger and younger and younger. And, <clears throat> you know, you and I reconnected here a while ago. You, you sent me some stuff from a, a recruiting service about an eighth grade quarterback. And, <laughs> you know, I was reading this thing. Sixth grade. Sixth grade quarterback. You're right. Sixth grade quarterback 
and you know and i remember reading this stuff and all the superlatives about it and then it was like four foot eight 97 pounds i'm like oh my god how old is this kid you know and and this is this is the thing it's like parents are being preyed upon by some unscrupulous people can, selling them the dream kids are being done that and now there's m- even more money and more popularity and more fame trickling into having a great highlight reel when you're 11 years old 12 years old um it, it I, I i'm sad to say i don't see it getting better because there's too much money in it. And the only way it gets better is family by family with sensible parents who say, we're not, we're not going to try to win that rat race, you know? Well, it's hard, right? It's, Mm. there's so much pressure on the parents because people are telling them, look at your kid's going to fall behind. Mm -hmm. And it's really because the way we measure success today. And I, you know, I talked about it before is, is okay the house the car the clothes the scholarship the the nil contract uh you know whatever they're they're it's all misguided you know success has become the most ill-defined word in uh american yeah. society you know let's i i look at it as how committed are you to helping your son or daughter or yourself as you, you know, you become an adult athlete to do the things that you need to do in order to reach your full potential. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. You know, we had, I had, this is the example that I use all the time. We had a kid named Robert Gallery who played for us, great all American. He was the second pick in the draft uh, by the Oakland Raiders, signed a contract for $60 million. Well, for him to reach his full potential, he needed to be the Outland Trophy winner. Mm-hmm. That's that's how good he was. Mm-hmm. Now we had another guy. His name was Will Lack. Mm-hmm. He was a walk-on. Mm-hmm. Okay, every day he came to practice and he he put on the look of the scout team for Robert Gallery to practice against mm-hmm. every you know every week. Mm-hmm. Now we finished seventh in the country that year. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, you know, we had a great, you know, had a great, great season. Which guy's more successful? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the regular fan's going to say Robert Gallery, mm-hmm. but we know what's going on, and we know how much Will Lack made Robert Gallery better, even mm-hmm. though he never had a scholarship, he never got into a game. Okay, he might be more of a success than Robert even was, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Because he did everything to reach his full potential. Now, Will Lack went on to Harvard Medical School, became a doctor, so he's doing okay for himself. But mm-hmm. that, that's where you know you you have these you you have these things that uh, you know yeah they're exploitive you know uh, no, no doubt about it. But um, everything's just totally out of whack and the parents are too afraid to take their foot off the accelerator. It takes a lot of guts Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to hold back and wait and, and see, you know, see what happens. But that would be my suggestion and not stay focused on the wins or any of that other stuff. Just stay focused on becoming the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think the, the other thing that's really interesting to me, Ken is, um, this idea of success and and you as you know your first collegiate coaching job was at as you mentioned Allegheny College um and Allegheny a division 3 school uh very different than University of Iowa um and you had an incredible success there you won a national championship um won you know uh, a lo- a lot of games but there's something that i love about the division 3 college athlete playing for the love of the game um playing for because they don't have a scholarship they don't have anything tying them to the team to you know they're already paying for school (laughs) they're doing all those things um what what what, did you enjoy that time of your of your career was there ever a time when you wanted to go back to that it it, it was awesome you know i every i i can't say that 
I enjoyed every level that I taught or coached at. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just, uh, it didn't matter to me what level it was. I was pretty much doing things the same way. Now people looked at the job differently. Like, mm -hmm. you know, nobody ever called my house at two in the morning when I was at Allegheny. Like I, I might've got a phone call at Iowa if I, you know, didn't call the right play. On, uh, <laughs> two. But the, uh, it, it just didn't, you know, it, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I just want to interrupt you and tell you a funny story that I don't know if you know the basketball coach Quinn Snyder used to be uh, oh, yeah. Utah Jazz and he just um, you had him on. Yep. He just got hired by Atlanta. Um, but yeah, I've had him on the podcast and he told this great story how when he was the basketball coach at University of Missouri, he used to get pizzas delivered and the pizza guy would like draw up plays on the pizza box for him. <laughs> and i'm thinking about did you did you ever have a pizza guy draw up some offensive plays for you or what no but we we had a guy who would <laughs> you know he'd send us notes every week and, and um and they weren't quite as nice as i wouldn't mind it if he gave me an actual play to run mm -hmm. my mom always wanted to run like this double reverse that she had in her mind <laughs> anyway uh the uh but after a while i would just not even open up the letters and I would send them back, return to, you know, I, 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 uh, or I put them in another envelope and address it to his wife, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Smith or whoever. Mm -hmm. So she, she could get an idea of what he was up to himself, you know? So, <laughs> uh, but no, we, it, it's, uh, we had, you know, you'd have, I had a guy call me one time at halftime. One guy called me in my called my office at halftime, like I was going to be there. Right, I'm uh -huh. in the locker anyway, and leaves this you know message about uh, a field goal that had slipped. He's a true freshman in his first game, slips and misses a field goal just before half. Mm -hmm. The guy calls, tells me how much you know, he knew I recruited him. Uh, this guy, you know, whatever that 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 stinks that that. And he like I would play to the GAs afterwards. You know, because I go, look at this is the business that you're going to get into, just so you guys know what's ahead for you. <laughs> you know, you're going to have somebody call you at halftime that actually thinks you're at your desk, um, you know, the, to give you some good advice. But, uh, you know, it's it, it's it, it's all it's fun everywhere. It can be fun everywhere. You're going to make it that way. But the mm -hmm. number one thing you need to do is stay focused on the experience of the players, yeah. you know, like the, you know, my youth coaches made it fun for me. The high school coaches, they taught, they taught us, you know, toughness and discipline and fundamentals and loyalty and some of the, you know, and the importance of teamwork, everybody puts team first, but, um, and then my college coach, I learned from my college coach how to really love your players. I mean, he just loved being around us, uh, you know, all the time. And, you know, and you can't fake that. Like it's authentic. Like you, when, when your players know if you're faking it uh, and they know when it's real and, and when it's real, it builds connection and it builds trust and it, it allows that coach, right. Because you knew that he loved you and he loved being around you and he wanted to make you better. Now he can tell you the truth. Right? right. He can tell you the hard truth. And that coaching is the ability to tell the hard truth at the right time uh, with the right words. That makes a difference. Um, but you, you, you have to sort of put deposits in the bank, right. Of, yeah. of yeah. trust before you, you just lay it. And I think a lot of people get into coaching kind of the first thing we talked about and just think they're going to spew all this knowledge or, you know, well, I saw, you know, such and such coach yelling at a player. So obviously I need to just scream and yell at someone, but you didn't see 99% of their interactions beforehand that allowed those couple of loud, harsh words in the moment to have an effect. No, you're right. And you know, the other thing, those, you know, all three of those coaches, you know, youth, high school and college coaches, they never talked about winning. They mm. talked about, again, doing, you know, doing your best. And, you know, you, you want to, you know, you want to know, Hey, like uh, what the great qualities 
you know, what, what the qualities are of great coaches. Yeah. It's pretty simple. It starts off with, you got a great person usually, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's number one. They're good people. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they, you know, they live in, um, they live in Jerry's uh, uh, river. The river. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's where they, that's where they live all the time. It's not about them. It's about everything. It's about everything else. It's, it's kind of, uh, I mean, it's just who they are. They're great. They're great teachers. Um, you know, they have a process, they have a system and they can communicate. They, they usually are great teachers also because they ask questions like, Hey, same things I'd ask the quarterbacks. What'd you see? What'd you think? What'd you feel? You know, those are, now I get good feedback. What'd you think? Okay. What'd you see? What'd you think? What'd you feel? You know, and because you're not out there on the field, you need to get proper feedback and they need to learn how to give it to you as well. And that, you know? that question can like, especially like, what did you see? I, I tell coaches this all the time because again, you're talking to your quarterback. He's looking at the field north, south. You're looking at it east, west. And so what he sees and what you see are two completely different things, right? And so you think maybe, you know, so-and-so was open and what he sees is, nah, the middle linebacker had that had that covered. Now, maybe on video later, you can go back and be like, yeah, I think you had him. But in the moment, yeah, like what he saw, and, 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 and I think that's the thing as well. If he didn't see it, now I can coach him. Because something was there. But if he saw it and made a different decision, well, fair enough. Maybe it was the wrong decision, but I now know, well, his field awareness, his play awareness, his awareness of the defense was good. And his decision making was the problem, right? Or he overthrew it. His technical execution was the problem. But unless you ask, what did you see? What did you think? What did you feel? You can't really coach, can you? Well, and even more important than that is back to the beginning of, you know, the traits of these great coaches. They all build relationships first Mm -hmm. because in the relationships are all based on trust and honesty, because I would tell the QBs, look at, don't BS me because if you do, I won't be able to help you. Mm-hmm. If you come out, you know, if you come out and just tell me, I ask you a question and you try to, you know, work your way through something that you don't really know, instead of just saying, coach, I don't know. I can help the guy that says, I don't know. But if he gives me a line about this or that, then now I'm thinking, hey, okay, he's got an idea what's going on. He just saw it differently. Mm-hmm. And it's just like the guys up in the booth, you know, they're way up there. And you'd think they get a good look at it, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, John. Ninety-five percent of the time, the quarterback is right, even when the guys up in the booth think they're right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's he hardly ever makes a mistake because he sees the field, you know, like you're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from you know from inside out, mm-hmm. and. He's got those point guard eyes that he can, you know, he can tell, he can really tell what's, what's going on. And, and you're right too, that the, the best coaches are demanding Mm -hmm. and, and they hold people accountable, obviously, but Mm -hmm. I've never, I've always felt like you could be very demanding as long as you are intentional about what you expect. Mm -hmm. You have to tell them exactly what you expect. And it's, you know, it's going to be hard, you know, and they might not get it the first or second or third time or whatever, whatever it may be. But, you know, because what are you doing? You're pushing when you're being demanding, you're pushing people out of their comfort zone, comfort zones. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, that gets a little kickback usually gets a little, you know, a little fight. They get a little feisty sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do then is circle back and remind them 
of your intentions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'll give you a story that will illustrate this. And this is a former player during the pandemic called me. Um, he, you know, he, he, he called me and said, Hey, uh, and he's a, he's a division three coach, head coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, he calls me and says, um, uh, Ken, you know, I got to tell you this story that I never told you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Oh man, I think, you know, there's, other stuff going on, you know, at, at that time as well. I'm like, okay, here we go. And uh, I said, go ahead, you know, fire away, John. And he he goes in and he starts. This is when I was a position coach at Allegheny before I became the head coach. And he said, one day I wasn't practicing. I wasn't practicing very hard or well. And you know, you read me like a book. And you kept demanding that I do this right, do that right. You know, it stayed right on my rear end for the entire practice to the, you know, to the point where I was really sick of, you know, the whole thing, sick of you, sick of football, whatever. And he's, you know, he's walking off the field like, this is it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he hears footsteps come up behind him on the gravel and um, and he says it was me. Mm-hmm. And I, he he said I put my arm around him, and I said, John, do you know why I expect so much out of you? Mm-hmm. And he goes, No, why? And, and I told him again mm-hmm. what I told him previously, but he had not remembered that you had the ability to be a great player in this program, mm-hmm. and help make us a great team, Mm -hmm. but you need to learn how to work hard every day and bring your focus, whatever, whatever it was. Okay. 30 years later, this guy's a head coach. He remembers that like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. What do you think I remembered? Nothing. Exactly. Zippity doo dah. Nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but that just goes to tell you or show you, you know, that these guys, you know, um, you know, they're listening. They're, you know, they're listening, they're watching, you know, they're thinking, but they are mostly feeling, which I've heard you guys talk about a lot as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're feeling and they're, and they're going and in, in their lives, you know, as, especially as college coaches as well, like our sole focus is on, the game, the plays, the scout, all that. They're going to class. They have, you know, girlfriends. They have other life stuff going on. Like there's yeah. so much in their heads. And and we just are the the football piece of it or the soccer piece of it or whatever. And it, it's so important. But that, I mean, that's such a great story. And I mean, those are the stories that always make me happy. You're and 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 they don't. Again, they rarely come around a month later. They usually come around 20 years later or 10 years later uh, when someone, you know, just says thank you or invites you to their wedding or something like that. And and again, they 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 share a story that oftentimes you have no recollection of. Um, and it's such an amazing thing. Yeah. And, and we had we actually had a staff rule that if you, you know, really had to get on somebody during practice that you needed to make sure you corrected, you know, corrected everything and that you were able to communicate to that player why you were as hard on him as you were. And, you know, you get him before he leaves the facility that day and get that, get that thing straight. So he leaves, leaves the locker room, you know, knowing that, he has a chance to be better tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, if, and, you know, if- and even like in this day and age right now, even if you miss them, right? Because I've had that where like I need to talk to so-and-so after practice and then they're gone, right? I'll send a text. If it's a young kid, I'll send an email to their parents and say, you know, for Johnny, for Kate or whatever, right? Like and just say, Hey, I just want to make sure, you know, you understand. I, I know it was hard on you today, but it's because I believe in you. And if, I think if you can do these things, you'll really make a difference. You know, I know you're trying and I know you're frustrated today, but I believe in you and, 
I look forward to coaching you again on Thursday, right? right. That that can lift a kid up for a week, a month, a year, right? Yeah. Um, and and I say to all the coaches who are youth coaches, that builds trust with those parents too, who says, "Well, oh, that coach sees my kid." Right, knows that she got in the car and she was sad today. She was frustrated today. She had a bad practice, and coach saw it, and coach and, and coach acknowledged it. Um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's great. Smiling. I, For those who aren't watching the video, Ken's smiling as I said. <laughs> no, that's that. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, and these coaches, you know, I mean, that's leadership as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, because. It, I think all great leaders possess three common characteristics. Number one, they provide a great example. Mm -hmm. Number two, they communicate in a clear, concise, and positive way most of the time. You know, and, mm -hmm. and the last thing they do is they care about helping the team, the athlete, way more than they care about themselves. Mm -hmm. and when you get that type of thing going, you can't, you know, you, you can't, you can't go wrong. And, yeah. and, you know, it's one of Mattis, you know, General Mattis's other quotes was, uh, you know, along the lines of, you can't let your pursuit of excellence get in the way of your compassion for your subordinates. Mm -hmm. You know, we can get so wrapped up in stuff. One year, one year we had a 20, we, we had a 28 game winning streak going mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, get better. The standard kept rising and rising with each ball game, but you know, and I felt that as the head coach, the staff felt it, the players, everybody felt we had to take it off of mm -hmm. the player. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you've got to be able to help them more than, you know, go after the ring type of thing. And, yeah. and if you can do that, you're going to be in, you know, in great shape as far as I'm concerned, because that really leads me into the last thing that a, a good, those those great coaches all have in common is they never forget. They never forget what it was like to be a player. Yeah. If, if you can maintain that somehow, some way, you'll be able to empathize with them all the time. Understand, mm -hmm. uh, this is what it was like in the weight room. Or I remember how tough it was to run those gassers or, mm -hmm. you know, it, this practice was brutal and, ex, you know, the 95 degree heat. Mm -hmm. You know, when you can't, when you can't relate anymore to those guys as far as remember what it was like for you and the obstacles that you faced and compare them to the obstacles that you're throwing in front of your current players, it might be time to seek out another profession. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, I, that's a really, the fact that you say that now, I wanted to ask you a question that is something unique about Iowa football and, and it's the uh, children's hospital in the stands there and the wave to the kids in the cancer center um, at, you know, was it a halftime or between the quarters or w whatever it is when everyone in the stands turns and waves to all these kids who are going through it. And, and I mean, is that something like I would think at every home game as an Iowa football player, looking up there, seeing what those little kids are going through, you just must sort of also bring you back to, you know, I got it pretty good. And if coach is being tough on me or this game isn't going well or whatever, like I'm not like, I'm still down here on the field playing. Like it just, this whole idea of, am I playing for a higher purpose than just winning the game? I'm playing for those kids up there in the window who are fighting cancer and a bunch of them aren't going to be around a year from now. Um, it, I mean, how did you use that as a coaching staff and how did that affect the psyche of your players? Well, yeah, I don't know that we, um, that we ever really, there, I mean, we talked to the players about 
how fortunate we were and what we were doing in that regard, like uh, both Kirk and Mary Ferentz, uh, and especially Mary was instrumental in having that children's hospital built, believe mm-hmm. it or not, mm-hmm. gigantic task. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were four ladies, I think, that came up with the idea of, um, you know, the wave. I can't quite remember um, the genesis of it, but, uh, you know, and then everybody bought in after the first, um, you know, the first quarter of every game, even the opponents. Yeah. Love it. Everybody, everybody loves it because it takes a minute uh, out of or, or however many minutes it takes to just put your thoughts somewhere else, not on you, you know, and give them, give, you know, give you, you know, give your uh, best wishes to some kids that really can use it. And our, but the, to answer your question, our players over the 18 years that I was there were always, always over at that hospital visiting kids Mm -hmm. all the time and uh, a lot of times they would wear different you know the the different bands uh around their wrists during a game or whatever it may be that those kids could see on tv represented them and but our kids were always very giving very involved in the community and especially involved in the in that hospital Um, Mm -hmm. yeah we were, were very fortunate we had a lot of tremendous young men that um you know, they, they knew what it was like, not only to give everything they had on the field, but to give, um, you know, uh, give back to other people. In fact, our, think- our, our, one ki- our one punter is from Australia. So mm-hmm. he, can't, uh, he can't take any money from the NIL because he needs a, a special green card or whatever. So he just donates. He just has everybody donate to the children's uh-huh. hospital. You mm-hmm. know, so, uh, and, you know, the... Our, our former center place for the Ravens now, you know, raised about 30 grand for, you know, for them, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's a special thing. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And it says a lot about uh, Kirk Ferentz, the head coach at Iowa, for those who don't know, and been there a long time, he's not going to get hired and fired or, or judged or on anything except winning football games. And yet to dedicate, him and his wife that much time and energy to build a, a children's hospital, a cancer center um, is just goes show like there is someone who sees that there is more to life than winning more to life than winning a football game. You know, that, that there, <laughs> that if, if all, you know, th- there's this um, late college baseball coach and I forget his name and he had a great quote and he said, um, you know, someone asked him why he treated and why he coached the way he did and why he treated people the way he did. And he reminds me of sort of your philosophy over it as well. He said, you know, I would just hate to be, uh, you know, at the pearly gates one day and, um, and God, you know, and God says, I gave you 600 young men, you know, boys to turn into men and you only turned them into baseball players. And, uh, you know, I, I think of, I think about that, quote a lot that that's that's our high, higher purpose right there yeah you're right i mean and and football well, all of sports every the thing that gets everybody's attention is you know the guys that make the big plays right mm-hmm. and i always felt it, and and why is it even important to know how to make a big play mm-hmm. and i remember i was speaking in front of a church group a couple of weeks after we had won the national championship at Allegheny mm-hmm. and this, um, this, you know, this uh, elderly lady uh, asked a question of me. She said, coach, why is that so important that you won the national championship for Allegheny? And I said, you know, I said, that's a heck of a question now. And, and I said, it's not in and of itself. It's not important at all, but it demonstrated to, the entire student body, the faculty, administration, people in town, even all of northeastern, northwestern Pennsylvania, excuse me, that we're all capable of doing something great with our lives at least one time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we can make a play. We can make a big play at least once. And all of this is only important 
because sooner or later, these athletes are leaving the game. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't taught them how to make a big play for their family, let's say if somebody gets cancer, if we haven't taught them how to make a big play for their community, or how to make a big play for their church, their corporation, their family business, whatever it may be, what good is it? Mm -hmm. What good is it? And that's why I've always wished, which I know it's impossible, but wouldn't it be great, John, if every kid that played youth sports had a chance, no matter what it was, if you're a soccer player, kick the winning goal, mm -hmm. little league, hit the winning home run, mm -hmm. you know, score the winning touchdown, you know, you know, hit the winning free throw. Whatever, just one time, mm -hmm. one time. Think mm -hmm. about how that would elevate the confidence level, the attitude, the approach that that young person would have towards the rest of the, you know the rest of their lives. And that's, I know it's unrealistic, but boy, that's where you know you really gain some confidence, and you really you know you really start to move forward with a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of these things because, you know, I mean, these, the, the great ones, you know, the great players, I mean, they've got work ethic that's just out the gates, you know, mm -hmm. just, I don't care if they're pros mm -hmm. or, you know, or wherever, but mm -hmm. we got to find out what they like first. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the key. Like yeah. I have, parents, have parents sit at my desk. And they would have, you know, Johnny's life all carved out, what major he was going to be, this, that, and the other thing. And, and I would try to advise them, which was easier to do, you know, 30 years ago. But, uh, hey, let's find out what he likes first. Mm -hmm. I never had a kid come in my office and said, hey, coach, I know I got a D in calculus one. And I know I'm flunking calc two right now. Mm -hmm. But, man. I love math so much. I just want to major in it. You, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Maybe, maybe you knew some guys like that at four. No, not at all. Not at all. Not but, at all. you know, it's, hey, do it like, you know, and sometimes I use the, uh, the ESPN analogy when it first came out, they used to have all the hunting and fishing shows on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And I'd say to the parents, I go, what do you think those guys are doing? They're mm -hmm. doing, they're doing what they like to do. And they mm -hmm. found out how to make a living at it. And that's mm -hmm. what we want. That's what we want your son to do as well. Yeah, that's important. Last kind of a little bit, you make the transition to the NFL. And now you have players who obviously are making lots of money and, and different things. And the, there's even, you know, maybe more scrutiny on a national level for what's happening there. What yet? I mean, for I still think for the best of the best athletes, they still want to be coached. They still want to get better, right? They still want to say, you know, coach, break it down. Help me get better. I want to be an all pro. I want to be a hall of famer. I, I want to go to this next level. Um, mm -hmm. What, I mean, did you, did you enjoy that piece of coaching in the NFL? Was there obstacles that took away the joy? Like, because I think we all find our niche, right? That like some people are like, no, nah, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, like that's my niche. I love that time. Um, what, what, what was your NFL experience like? Well, you know, you've got guys that are like, you know, some can be mid thirties and some are 20, you know, yeah. because they come out early for the draft and it was I, I enjoyed it. The challenge was a little different. You know, there's yeah. a couple of things. I mean, those guys, again, work ethic, the guys I was around anyway, yeah. they, they went after it as hard as, as hard as they could. They were great listeners, great learners. And, uh, and they were pretty good communicators as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and if they felt like you could help them, you know, they're listening all, all the time. They mm -hmm. believe in fundamentals and they know a lot about the game too. So it's, a, it's more of a collaboration mm -hmm. than it is, you know, strict and in, strict instruction. And, and, and they know there's no shortcuts. There's, mm -hmm. you know, you got to take care of yourself um, and, and go from there. They, their ability to make plays is what can, you know, make things right on the field a lot of times. And mm -hmm. like I, I would talk to the quarterbacks about, Hey, 
even though there I coach receivers, but I talk to the quarterbacks, your job is to make it right out there on the field. If something's wrong, you've got to fix it. Well, these guys, those NFL guys, they can fix things. And they they got great focus, too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, great focus. Um, and they're, they're unflappable in a lot of ways. I got it. I had a I had a kid I had a kid at Iowa who he um he threw four interceptions four interceptions in a game mm -hmm. uh, that we were behind uh, we were in the last ten minutes we were behind by three scores mm -hmm. and we came back and uh, it, and we won the game mm -hmm. and um, and I said his name was Rick Stanzi I said Rick. I can't remember coaching a guy that threw four, you know, four picks in a game. He goes, coach, I threw five, mm -hmm. five, five interceptions, unflappable. We, we ran the same plays that we scored on in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, he just connected on them. That's what those professional guys are the same way. Those pitchers, they give up, they give up a home run. They just get a ball from the ump. They go back to the mound, like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how you have to operate. But the key is, here's the thing, the, the, great, the, the great ones are all immune. They're, they, they have an immunity um, to the number one disease that's killing a lot of young Americans these days. And actually probably killing a lot of Americans, period. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Excuse-itis. <laughs> the great like ones it. are the great, the great ones are immune, immune from it. And uh, they have immunity. And there's no, there's no vaccination for it. There's no mm -hmm. vaccination. You don't want to catch it. And the only thing that can cure it is accountability. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what those guys are great at doing, holding themselves accountable. I love because that. Because they know you know, the first contract gets them in, second contract makes a difference, third contract allows them to keep going. And it takes, you know, it takes a lot of work and effort for them to, you know, get all that, uh, you know, get all that stuff right. So it's, it's, it's critical, but yeah, I love it. I, yeah. Because things are changing so much now recruiting. Yeah. You know, you talk about the NIL, what about the what about the transfer portal? Yeah, exactly. Total craziness, right? You, and most people don't realize this that it's it has become a quiet way for guys to quit. Yeah. That, yeah. And and their, you know their parents can't say anything about it. They go in the portal. There's only about forty percent of the true Power Five guys get get back to Power Five once they go in. Right, That's you're it. usually going down, yeah. You're, you're usually going to go down. And the worst part about the portal is it's taking away opportunities for high school kids. Yeah. Where if you had 25 scholarships to give previously, you might have had one or two transfers, and 23 high school kids got the scholarships. Right. Well, so now there are, there are teams like in the uh, group of five – that are given only half to yeah. high school. They have, right. If they, they have 24, they'll give 12 to a high school kid, and then 12 will go to transfers. Mm -hmm. And then there are now schools, there are schools now, they didn't offer one high school kid all transfers. Yeah. So how does that help? How does that help football? How does that help any sport? Right. Because with, with it, it doesn't help. Like, I, I get the I get the idea behind the, the portal and this idea that the the ability to leave if a situation is just totally unworkable. Fair enough. But, yeah, I, I think I love the way you said it. It's a way to quietly quit. It's a way to just shirk out. It, it makes it hard to coach people. Right. Because I just, you know. It just it goes back to what you just said. It allows me to make an excuse. It's not me. It's obviously this coaching staff. It's this program. And if I just walk out the door, everything will be fine, right? But 
I don't have the work ethic. I don't have the, the thing. And, and I think that idea, at least, you know, in football and basketball, where you had to sit out a year, it gave you pause to think about, is it really worth, is it so, so important for me to transfer that I don't play for the next year versus, um, yeah, nah, it's not working. I don't really like this coach. I don't want to work very hard here. I'm stuck behind this guy and I don't want to outwork him. So I'm just going to leave. Yeah. And I like, and he, I like this idea that you usually transfer down, not up. Right. And, you know, I think there should be, I mean, it's got to get fixed. And yeah. I, you know, like um, it's really the whole NCAA has been somewhat of a uh, catastrophe, you know, whether it's been COVID NIL mm -hmm. or the transfer portal. You know, the leadership that uh, the recent president Emmert has given is, in my opinion, deplorable. But, yeah. um, and I think, I'm hoping Governor Baker will be mm -hmm. able to do a much better job. You know, I, I, I believe he will. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, the, this stuff, the, their relationships aren't going to matter anymore, John. Right, yeah. Transfer and or an NIL can come up and you know it doesn't matter how great a relationship it is it becomes in some instances it'll become uh, a financial decision that you know a family has to make because it's the best thing for them economically so yeah. i mean there's all kinds of things at stake right now that uh, are are liable to change the whole landscape of what we're looking what we're looking at and what college football used to be right and it's the wild west with it too i mean we just had the example of the kid who right i think it was had committed to miami for 1.2 million of nil and then they bailed on him and he left and i think he's at arizona state or something like that and it's like you know it's the wild west and then it's only a matter of time before you know where's that money coming from it's it's dark money it's gambling money it's you know organized crime it's whatever you know, who's paying your bill, throw a game, you know, throw a few points our way, whatever it is like it, it's yeah. It, the, the fact that they just sort of, you know, pulled the plug and let the water pour out of the tub and say, let's see what happens. I think is a huge disservice um, to the athletes and to the coaches and to the programs. And I, I think the intent being, Hey, kids should be able to get compensated for some of the stuff they're doing is okay. But the implementation has been a nightmare and there's going to be a lot of horror stories, I think, before it gets cleaned up. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, the problem is there's no enforcement in the uh, NCAA and that, right. that that's become a, a major, major issue, you know, right. and, and um, I don't know, you know, it's, it, it's not an easy fix, but but these, and again, a lot of it goes back on the head coaches themselves because, believe me, Kirk Ferentz, Kirk's been at it long enough. Nick Saban's been at it long enough. A bunch of these guys have been doing this. They, you know, they 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 would have a pretty big say in what would happen. But, you know, we just, you know, it, it's hard to take the time out of those jobs. They're so busy mm -hmm. to do that. But unless they do or somebody like them gets involved, it's never going to change because most people don't know how to change it for the better because yeah. they're all, they're all outsiders. You know, it's kind of like, you know, um, it's like the parent, it's like the parents that, um, you know, are, are involved in some of the youth sports stuff that's going on right now. And, and, and believe me, the parents even try to get involved at the college level or at the pro level too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I would always I would always caution the parents on at whether it's high school or college is let's you have to be careful that you don't destroy the relationship between you and your son because of what you're going about and mm -hmm. how you're about it, what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, because that's critical. I mean, there's, you know, we have rules just like you have in the new sport. You, you have, you have great rules to mm -hmm. keep parents, you know, uh, in, you know, in their lanes. But 
that doesn't mean that they won't destroy the relationship between them and their child. Uh, you know, if, uh, if they get the opportunity and, to, and and that could probably be a whole nother podcast talking about the change of how college coaches now have to engage and work with and deal with some parents who are nipping away, wanting to talk about their kid over and over and over. And and again, all you're doing is delaying that child's rise into adulthood. Right. You're sheltering right. them from having to have difficult conversations, from being told the truth and and acting upon it. And so, uh, yeah, but well, we have to bring this one to a close here, Ken. So, you know, thank you so much for your time. This was a great conversation. Sure. Some great stories. I'm, I, I'll never I'm never going to get the visual out of you walking around the bases with a bag of flour um line in line in the base pass that's a pretty awesome story <laughs> yeah, yeah we got it done without uh, <laughs> they weren't as straight as you would like i can tell you that right now yeah yeah that's okay though you got it done it's exactly right it, um it, it's only adults that think the lines have to be perfectly straight and the goals have to be the same size yeah you're you're exactly uh you're you're exactly right for sure yeah Yep. Well, Ken, I, if people, I, I don't know if you do any sort of posting or social media or anything like that. I know you just kind of have an email list that I'm on of people you send stuff to, but, uh, you know, is there any way if people wanted to connect with you after this, the best way for them to get in touch with you? I think, uh, pr you know, probably, uh, the best way would be, uh, an email, uh, Ken O'Keefe 88 at Gmail dot com all right perfect we'll we'll put that in the show notes um and stuff like that thank you so much for your time today thanks for being on the way champions and thanks for all you do uh appreciate all you do john keep up the good work man it's thank not you. easy thank you thank